It matters not if a lion is male or female. I'm TK, your guide to the past as we uncover the people, events, and little-known facts hidden in the shadows of your old history textbooks. From empress baddies to activist profiles, turkey gods and the history of the toothbrush, tattoos, Pompeii peepees, and everything in between, you can find it all here. There's no telling how far we'll dig or how many historical facts we'll re-examine. No event is too small and no topic is too big because this is for the love of history. Welcome, 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 my friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and a weird history. What time is it? Empress Bad Time. What time is it? Empress Bad Time. I am so excited because it has been approximately 700 years since we've done an Empress Baddie episode. And this is our first Empress Baddie episode of 2022, which makes it extra special. And the baddie in question today is Tamar the Great of Georgia. And I hear you. TK, why is she so great? Excellent question. Let me go ahead and tell ya. Grab your crown and your most luxurious robe and let's get to it. Today, we are talking about Georgia, but not the state of Georgia, my friend. The country of Georgia. And you know what? I did not know diddly squirtly squat about Georgia before researching this episode, but I am now the proud owner of some Georgian history that I am going to tell you about now because we need some context before we go batty diving, which, which as I'm saying that now, speaking TK and writing TK were two different people. I don't know what writing TK was thinking. That is a horrible line to say. <laughs> Batty diving. Anyways, we, <laughs> we need to talk about Georgia to understand how cool Tamar was. This is the most brief history, but here it goes. Georgian history and culture is very interesting. It's a mix of Anatolian, European, Persian, Arabian, Ottoman, and Far Eastern cultures all mixed up together. And people have been living in the country that we now know as Georgia for literally since people. Since people. Not even joking. Evidence for the earliest occupation of present-day Georgia goes back to 1.8 million years ago. As evident from the excavations of the Damanisi in the southeastern part of the country. It's a, it's a place in the southeastern part of Georgia. So this evidence of people being in Georgia 1.8 million years ago is the oldest evidence of humans anywhere in the world outside of Africa. Which is banana sandwich. So after a few million years or so, Georgia was starting to become unified in the late 800s and pretty much got there by the 10 hundreds. But there were some pesky groups called the Byzantines and they were super duper rude and they kept trying to hog in on Georgian land and resources. But Georgia was like, nah, we're not having any of that. And they fought for like 70 years. But the Georgian king, King George III, which is hilarious. Can we stop? King George of Georgia. And this is a very different King George from the European King George. Different, different Georges. <laughs> but I digress. So King George gets everything handled pretty well, but is still struggling with losing territory, which is not a big deal really for him. 
So King Georgie McGeorge George is cruising along with his unified country until a group of no good, dirty, rascal nobles had an issue with him being king and the fact that Georgie Porgy had no sons to inherit the throne. He, in fact, had only two daughters. And to make matters worse for the nobles, George didn't care. He said on many accounts that it matters not if a lion is male or female, referencing his two highly capable daughters, one of which would become his heir. And the nobles could not abide by this. No woman should rule, they thought, but little did they know what kind of woman they were about to deal with. The year is 1160, and the first child of King George III of Georgia is born. It's a precious little baby girl, and rather than being disappointed, Daddy George is stoked AF. Not a lot is known about Tamara's childhood, but it's reasonable for us to assume that she was highly educated. Her father wanted her to be prepared as possible to take the throne and rule the country when her time came to rule. Every account that I have read about Tamar said that she was incredibly intelligent, a master strategizer, and a super good negotiator. In 1177, the nobles, remember those dudes, they were starting to act up, and they were like, um... We don't really like the fact that tomorrow is going to be uh, your heir. And BTW, we don't think that Georgie boy should even be king in the first place. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start a coup. We're going to try to kill the king and Tamar and put this other guy, Demna, in power instead. And to make a long story short, the coup did not work. <laughs> People ended up banished, others were driven out of Georgia, and a few people were executed, and poor Demna lost his balls. <laughs> I'm sorry. He was, he was castrated, which is not funny. It's not funny. But, like, why? Why, George? Why did you choose that as, as the punishment? Oh my gosh, it's just dawning on me right now. Is it to make sure that he didn't produce any heirs? Like, you tried to kill my heirs, so I kill your unborn heirs? Oh my god. That's a horrible, horrible punishment, George. Jeez. Gosh. And not only did he take this poor man's testicles, but he took his eyeballs too. So now, this poor guy... Demna, he, he has no balls and no eyes. No, no eyeballs and no ball balls. Left. <laughs> no balls left in his body, eyes or otherwise. I, I will digress. Needless to say, the coup was thoroughly squashed. And a year later, in 1178, George thought it was time for Tamar to get some on-the-job training, if you will. And in an act never done before, King George made Tamar his co-ruler. They were equals in every right. Basically, a huge middle finger to all the rest of the people who doubted Tamar's ability and her right to the throne. But any doubts that the people had would soon be quelled because our Empress Batty friggin' showed up and showed out. And her true test would come in 1184, the year her father passed away. The death of her father was devastating for Tamar. They were incredibly close but she would have no time to mourn. With her father's lessons ringing in her brain, Tamar set to work solidifying her position as Georgia's one and only ruler. 
she immediately started forging connections with the senior royals, as well as the head of the Georgian church. Even though she was crowned by her father six years before his death, there was a group of people called the Aristavi, a.k.a. the princely class, and they came crawling out of the damn woodworks being like, me, we want to have Tamar recrowned. We want to give her the special scepter to symbolize that her power comes from us and not from God. Even though literally every ruler of Georgia had accepted the scepter, the leadership scepter from the church, which is what she had already done in her first coronation. So what was Tamar to do? What would you have done in this situation, my friend? Because... Part of me goes like, this, this princely class people uh, better GTFO because I'm going to do what I want and I don't need to be recrowned by you. <laughs> but thankfully, I am not Tamar, who had much better judgment than I would have had. It was risky but necessary for Tamar to concede to the Aristavi. To appease them, she accepted their demand of recrowning her, and they were super stoked, which calmed them down enough, but also made Tamar dangerously dependent on them for power. And just a little aside, we have to remember that she is 18 years old when her father died. 18 years old, surrounded by people who don't want her in power and who hate her. Because Georgia has never had a woman king. And yes, there have been women who were like placeholder rulers until a son was old enough to rule, but never had there been a woman with the title of king before. So our girl Tamar was on some treacherous grounds. She was walking a tight rope between people accepting her and another freaking coup. But after some growing pains, Tamar came into her own as the king of Georgia. But it would take some time and a terrible relationship, which we'll talk about later, to finally solidify her position. But eventually she did outsmart all of those stuck-up princely class asshats that thought they could control her. She flipped the script on them and created the most solid political and advisory group in Georgian history. Tamar not only finessed the elites into submission, she got the church on her side as well. And if somehow I were forced at gunpoint to generalize all of the histories of the Middle Ages, like if a masked figure came to me, held me at lightsaber point and said, what should I know about the Middle Ages? I would then be forced to tell them this Jedi masked villain that wherever the church goes, the people follow. And that is what is most important in this time period in history. So what I'm saying in a very ridiculous <laughs> way is if, if you want to be a good ruler during this time, you've got to get the church on your side and Tamar, being the smart cookie that she was, dedicated herself to the church. And in doing so, made it abundantly clear that the church and the people could expect loyalty and cooperation from her. She declared, Judge according to righteousness, affirming good and condemning evil. Begin with me. If I sin, I should be censured. For the royal crown is sent down from above as a sign of divine service. And from that moment, the nobles, the church, and the people were hooked. And with their support behind her, she could do anything. But there was just one more thing she had to do to make her ascension to the throne and her royal succession unshakable. Get married make some babies. And that's precisely what she did. And just a little spoil, spoiler alert. That's our spoiler alert. This guy turns out to be an absolute fuckboy. 
and an abusive prick. And I don't want to waste more breath on him than I absolutely have to. So here's the long short of it. Tamar was pressured by those friggin' princely elite douchebags to marry someone. That someone being a twat named Yuri Boglibuski, also known as Georgi Rusi. He was Russian or Russic, which is a minor kingdom in what would eventually be Russia. And he was a prince. But he turned out to have major small dick energy and couldn't deal with the badass wife. And he started getting abusive and slipping around with anyone in the palace that he could find. And remember how I said Tamar would eventually come find her voice and make everyone bend to her awesomeness? Well, Tamar had had it with this piece of human garbage beauty and was like, bro, we're getting a divorce. I'm done with your shit. I forgot who I was for a minute, but I am motherfucking Tamar the Great. And she divorced him, which was bananas for a regular woman to do, let alone a noble woman, let alone the freaking king queen. But she did it because she is a motherfucking boss. But Yudi did not like this. So he started a coup, another freaking coup, which Tamar stomped, stomped the ever-living goodness out of it. And in her infinite mercy, she spared the trash goblin's life by banishing Yudi from Georgia forever. Which if I had the power to banish exes, I would. Hands up, friend. If you would banish some exes, I've got a few. <laughs> so after her divorce, there was nothing that could stop her. She started building schools, infrastructure, churches, and not just any churches and buildings. Freaking badass ones. Like a monastery in a cave, a set of caves in Varsdia, which looks like a giant beehive of or, or like wasps nest it's just a bunch of holes in the side of the cliff which look pretty unassuming until you go into these holes and they are incredibly gorgeous churches on the side of a freaking cliff which so cool in addition to her love of building things she was also a patron of arts and science georgia had unprecedented scientific advancements and amazing artistic masterpieces that thrived under her rule. People all over Georgia were living their best life. Literally, she created Georgia's golden age. She did eventually marry and this time for love to a beefcake of a man named David Solson who was also a prince but less like Prince Farquaad and more like Prince Beefcake Charming. And he was a military mastermind. Together, they planned incredibly daring initiatives to expand Georgia's territory and get back land that had been lost through the ages. During the peak of Tamar's Golden Age, Georgia stretched from the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea, over the mountains to the north, and into modern-day Armenia and Iran to the south. She was everywhere. Tamar became so powerful and so well-liked by other countries that her envoys were welcomed as far as Jerusalem, where they were given free passage to go pretty much wherever they wanted, which was super-duper rare at the time because other Christian rulers and other Christian countries were not allowed to just go ever wherever they wanted. She was dubbed the Queen of Queens, the Queen of Kings, the Glory of the World, Kingdom, and Faith. The sun never set on Tamar's empire, at least not while she was alive. And Tamar's death is quite mysterious. Some accounts say that she died in 1207, while others say in 1210. But the most common assumption about her death is that Tamar fell suddenly ill in 1213 and quickly passed away. But 
what's even more mysterious is we have no idea where she is buried. There are several legends surrounding her burial, like she's buried somewhere in a secret cave or that her son, the next in line, the king, the next King George, took a secret pilgrimage to Jerusalem to spread his mother's ashes. But my personal favorite, and the one that I choose to believe in my heart, is that Tamar did not, in fact, die. She is simply sleeping in a cave deep in the Caucasus. One day, she will awake and emerge from the cave, and a new golden age will dawn for Georgia. We have come to our final thought, dear one, and it is a bit of a tangent that I wanted to address, but not in the main part of the episode for reasons that I will explain. If you Google Tamar the Great, much like you would Google Cleopatra, most of the sources will inevitably talk about, oh my god, Tamar was so beautiful. She was as beautiful as she was smart. Her beauty was only comparable to her brain's. Bleed, 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 bleed. They go on and on. And I'd like to make a quick proposal, if I may. And I may. Thank you, me. You're welcome, me. If historians and journalists and whoever publishes historical content is going to keep doing this thing where they constantly talk about how beautiful and smart women are, as if the two are mutually exclusive then we need to do the same with male historical figures as well. For example, oh, Abraham Lincoln. He was as smart as he was dark and handsome. Mark Anthony was not only devilishly handsome, but not too bad at conquering shit as well. So that's my proposal. We just talk about men in history the same way we talk about women in history. Or we stop equating women historical figures with their beauty. Like, how good of a ruler they are with how beautiful they are. It doesn't matter. It truly does not matter. Because if you think about it, the way Tamar looked is the least interesting thing about her. And the same goes for you too, friend. Show up as you are, you gorgeous, dehydrated minx. Well, my friend, that is all she wrote for today. I really enjoyed this episode. And if you did too, leave a rating and a review or send this episode to your favorite cousin who you don't speak to really except for at like family functions. Use this as an icebreaker. (laughs) Just send it to them unsolicited. (laughs) If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can head to the show notes or www.fortheloveofhistorypodcast.com to find a link to Patreon, Patreon and Good Pod donations. Thank you so much for your support and for just blowing me out of the water with the positive feedback on our first season two episode. It was amazing. So thank you so much, dear one. Drink your water, take care of yourself, and I will see you next week when we talk about the real-life warrior women that inspired the Wakandan king T'Challa's all-women guard. Bye! Why is there a metronome right now? Okay. (laughs)